there's something really special about the music written for video games. Video game music works like any other genre. Same notes, same chords, same harmonies, but its connection to an interactive medium gives that music a whole new range of the things it can do. Interactivity makes video games a unique part of modern culture, since games change and respond to players in real time. That changes how video games approach music too. Players aren't just passively listening to a soundtrack, they're effectively the conductors. This is Next Level, a show about how video games are shaping the real world. And in this episode, we're listening in to all the ways video game music has become a cultural force in its own right and expanded the range of what music can do. I can do cozy stuff and like chiptune stuff usually yeah. on the spot. With that. Wow. <laughs> That's kind of cozy and ghostly. I was thinking maybe something cozy and spooky-ish for fall. Yeah. I don't know. I'm gonna try. Most of my guitars I bought specifically because they're used on video game soundtracks. Like my electric one was for uh, Halo. I bought this nylon string acoustic guitar for um, the Grudo Valley soundtrack in Ocarina of Time. Max Duggan composes music for films in video games. He worked with composer Disaster Piece on the soundtrack for Mini Metro, a minimalist puzzle game about running subway systems. He'll hit me up and say, hey, we need uh, something for a Chicago level, for example. So I'll pick a chord progression that I think represents you know, Chicago the best. So I want Chicago to have that kind of longing feel yeah. to it. I, I try to find a chord progression that I guess has a lot of extensions to it so it can just keep adding new information, not get tiring. Composing for video games is a different beast than scoring a film. Movie soundtracks rely on the specific pacing of the scene to set their tone and intensity. Video games don't have that luxury. A soundtrack in a specific level might play for five minutes or five hours, depending on how each individual player approaches the game. One way composers solve that problem is by looping their music, ensuring each piece can be seamlessly repeated until it's time for the next beat of the game. It's more challenging than it sounds, because, you know, the soundtrack for a big boss fight has to sound as good on the player's first attempt as it does on the 30th. Having to write something on loop that isn't tiring over and over is, a, like, that took a lot to get used to. And now I'm in this weird, like, procedural music niche and, like, adapted music niche is most of the gigs I get now. The niche Duggan is referring to is part of what makes video game music special its ability to generate and adapt itself to how the game is being played. Mini Metro is a prime example of this. The game's code ties specific musical ideas to elements as they appear. As each level subway system gets more complex, so does the game's soundtrack, musically mirroring the game's progression from slow and simple to frantic and chaotic. We. Uh, essentially just establish like, okay, it can generate these chord progressions with these notes at these rhythms. We just have little sine waves for the chord tones and everything. Like they're not anything super complicated. They're kind of eerie sounding on their own. <laughs> but then when you layer it all over each other, you get this nice like 
cozy ambient sound for everything. Yeah, it was a really weird way to work on EP to have like generative music meeting linear music, but yeah, as long as I can write something that sounds pretty and I can do a 20 minute playthrough and not hate it afterwards, it's kind of what solidifies it for me. <laughs> I wanted to have a different feel from the in-game soundtrack, so I had them fade in these kind of giant sweeps of sounds. Composing soundtracks like this involves a lot of collaboration with the game designers to understand what parts of the game are going to affect their music. But in a sense, making procedural music relies on an additional collaborator, the player. So you can see this is literally me just playing Mini Metro in different levels layered over each other. And then from there... So yeah, that's me just doing like beats within the game. I've seen Mini Metro out in the wild sometimes, like people playing it on their phones and it feels really weird. Um, but I, I'm shocked at how far like that little like train game has gone. I didn't expect it to be like the thing that kind of launched me into this career path. Video games have changed what writing music can look like, but beyond the work of composing, they've also changed how we listen to music too. Video game music covers a wide range of genres, everything from choral chants Feed us. to punk rock, sometimes even within the same game. But no matter the style, there's a few key abilities that make video games a unique format. There's even a field of academic study for it, Ludo Musicology. The word ludomusicology is used to refer to ideas of music and play. Often people use it to talk about video game music, because video game music is a really great way to investigate ideas of music and playfulness. Tim Summers is a senior lecturer in music at Royal Holloway University of London and a founding member of the Ludo Musicology Research Group. Over the years, video game music has been heavily defined by the technology that's hosting it. And although modern gaming music can pretty much sound like anything, early video game music had some strict technical limits. Those are chiptune sounds from original arcade machines and consoles, which could only generate a limited palette of sounds that composers had to work through. Those limits led to a similar aesthetic across early video game music, basic arrangements of computerized beeps, and as a result, some of gaming's most memorable soundtracks. There is a story that you hear an awful lot, like game music was beeps and boops and now it's orchestras. Yes, the technology was different, but it's brilliant in its own way. Even at this early stage, composers were exploring the techniques that would make video game music uniquely memorable for its players. Games like Mario and Sonic relied on simple melodies for their levels. Those melodies are still anchoring those major franchises, and they're still instantly recognizable to fans. Game music, it's always been this like accretion as we've added to the possibilities. We've never really let go of the early stuff or supplanted it. Dana Plank is a musicology lecturer at The Ohio State University, specializing in music and identity. There's something for um, the, the aesthetic of having things be simple, very colorful, very stylized, because there, we end up putting a lot of ourselves into it. The technical limits of early games left a lot of room for players to fill in the details. For example, it takes some imagination to pretend this mess of pixels is a heroic knight. Similarly, a sparse video game soundtrack could still use their computerized tones to evoke a grand sweeping orchestration. <laughs> Players just had to connect the dots on their own. We also spend so long with video game music, it becomes you know, ingrained in our brains, particularly if it's a loop that's going round and round and round. We adopt it personally when it responds to us, it's part of our character that we're playing, and it becomes really meaningful for us when we are prompted to interpret. But the relationship players have with video game music isn't a one-way street. It's a dialogue between the players and the composers. 
Soundtracks often convey information about a scene to the audience, but video games take it a step further by providing actionable information. Violin crescendo in a horror film means you're about to watch something scary happen, but in a game, it means you've got to act or watch your character get murdered. Musical rules can also reinforce a game's mechanical rules. If, say, a player keeps Sonic underwater too long and he starts drowning, the music reflects that by getting louder, faster, more intense, and almost traumatizing, frankly. The music is communicating information from the game's designers to the players. If you want to succeed at the game, pay attention to the soundtrack. It can tell us about whether we're in danger, whether we're safe, um, whether we're in a fantastical futuristic world or if we're in the past. So music is engaging constantly with both the gameplay elements and the story elements at the same time. That explains why video game music has such a powerful hold on its players. It's deeply interwoven with the media, but it can also exist outside of it. Given how people identify with video game music, it shouldn't be surprising the remix culture that comes with the industry. The close bonds players form with the soundtracks of their favorite games can drive whole new levels of creativity, even inspiring massive fan conventions and whole new genres of music. There's a music festival for almost every popular genre, and video game music is no exception. Let's go party! Wow! This is MAGFest, short for the Music and Gaming Festival, a four-day video game music convention where musicians and fans gather to play music, go to shows, and generally celebrate the art of video game music. It's also a big opportunity for fan musicians to showcase their connection to the genre. Let's do this. You ready? You ready? This community is so supportive. This community is so enthusiastic. You can see all these wonderful people here. Like, we all are here because we love video games. And I think you can feel it on stage, the support. Lacey Johnson is a musician who covers video game music on her YouTube channel. And she's one of many artists drawn to video game music as a way to express themselves. As a piano student who hated playing classical music, I went, you can play video game music on the piano? I had no idea. With a medium that I just love, I'm constantly just inundating myself with the music. Since video game music covers a wide range of genres, it's easy for musicians of all stripes to find something that calls to them. It's why Johnson's high energy rock songs can feature alongside classical pianists and jazz quartets at MAGFest. The game companies that originally released these songs have varying views on this kind of fan creation. Some enjoy the vitality it adds to game communities, while others crack down on unlicensed works. Cover musicians have to tread carefully when it comes to choosing works to cover, but Johnson insists that business decisions shouldn't impact the creative process. You know, at the end of the day, too, it's a business, and I do have to put food on the table. And so um, I want to be sure I'm choosing things that are licensable for the most part. Like we're, we're artists. We're all creating and doing things that inspire us and make us feel alive. And I think regardless of what a licensing situation is, you should still create that art and still make it. It's not just the games that inspired the music. It's the consoles, too early game machines have such a distinctive sound profile that a bunch of musicians have started using them to make music. I am a child of the 80s. I was raised on this stuff. I'm a nerdy gamer kid, right? You know, like, I'm, I'm just uh, enjoying this music. 
Brendan Becker, aka Inverse Phase, is a musician who makes what's called chiptune music, music designed around the technology of old game consoles. How did NES composers back in the day, you know, get that soundtrack to come out of there? And how did they get those certain, you know, echoey effects? Or how did they do the arpeggios or whatever? Early video games were working with extremely limited hardware capabilities when it came to audio. Different machines approached audio in different ways, which means tapping into these specific audio capabilities turns the console into a unique instrument. All of these sound chips are engineered by different people unless they're literally the same sound chip. Most of them can make, uh, you know, like three tones at a time and white noise. But no one was thinking, oh yeah, maybe we could do music out of that until someone did. And then someone else needs to leapfrog that and, you know, make a chip that does actual you know, music. Chiptune artists embrace the challenges that come with the technical limitations, leaning into the limitations to produce something new. I do feel like there is a limit, but I also do enjoy finding ways to break out of those limits. Part of the fun in writing chip tunes is dealing with those limitations. Finding new avoidances in old hardware is a big draw for chiptune musicians. And for fans of the genre, chiptune music invokes the same simple melodies of the old music players are already attached to. Video games have inspired this deep connection to their music for decades, and that connection's been strong enough to inspire new levels of creativity from fans. And while gaming's interactive nature has shaped its music, that music has also fundamentally altered the games it's attached to. The melodies and orchestrations have evolved over the years, right alongside the games they accompany. And today, even the most advanced franchises wouldn't feel complete without their iconic scores. My Sonic remixes required a lot of thought and a lot of time and care to put together. <laughs> I, I believe you.